Hi, I'm Jan Bitkowski. I'm director of the Banbury Center here at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. And this is the last day of the 78th symposium at, uh, here at Cold Spring Harbor. And it, after uh, three or four days of baking heat, it's now a bit on the cool side. I hope uh, my guest here, Pippa Marek from uh, Howard Hughes Medical Institute at the National Jewish in uh, Denver, uh, looks warm enough in her cardigan. Yep. Pippa, I have never heard of ABC cells. Mm. So will you teach me my ABC? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> So a few years ago, we became interested in this issue about why um, many autoimmune diseases become more are more prevalent in men than women, uh, in females, than in women than men, that way around, yes, in women than men. And um, there are a lot of uh, genome-wide studies have been done to look at this issue, what is it, um, and they haven't, many of them, come up with anything special about overexpressed in women than men, although, of course, we know that hormones, hormones themselves, mm -hmm. the sex hormones, estrogens and testosterone, and the androgens, have a huge effect on this issue. That is, in, in mice and uh, humans, estrogens are pro, pro uh, stimulate the disease, whereas androgens are usually protective, especially that's been done in mice. We don't have too many castrated men. <laughs> Not these days. Really. Not these days, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> well, that'd be interesting to go back and take a look at that. Um, anyway, so we thought, well, one of the things might be there might be things that are just about the n immune system itself that are not just, it's not just a hormonal issue. The immune system itself may be slightly different in females mm -hmm. than males. Mm -hmm. So we took a look in female and male mice, just normal, healthy C57 black six mice. And uh, for some reason or other, we had some old mice sitting around on the shelf at the same time. So we looked in both young mice of either gender and old mm -hmm. mice of either gender. And we came across these cells in the spleens of these mice um, that had markers that were like dendritic cells, CD11C, CD11B, these integrin markers that are used often to characterize dendritic cells. Mm -hmm. uh, but it turned out that they, w they appeared, uh, cells with these markers on them appeared in larger numbers in the spleens of elderly female mice than males. And to our surprise, they turned out to be not dendritic cells at all, but B cells. They, they have immunoglobulin on their surface. If you put them in culture and stimulate them in the right way, mm -hmm. they secrete immunoglobulin, et cetera, et cetera. So um, we started to look in autoimmune strains of mice to see did these, mice, did these cells show up in autoimmune strains, and they do at about the same time as the mouse develops autoimmunity. And it, even in the mice which are male, which are beginning to become autoimmune, make autoantibodies and so on, these same kinds of B cells show up. They have markers on the same markers, CD11C, CD11B. Um, and it turns out that in the autoimmune mice, they're not actually secreting antibody at the time, they're precursors. They're B cells that are on their way to become mm -hmm. plasma cells, but they haven't got there yet. And in C57 black six mice, if you isolate these cells and stick them in culture and stimulate them, they make autoantibodies, even if mm. they come from normal old black six mice. They're ju they don't make very high titer of these antibodies, but they are the cells that are the precursors mm. for autoantibody productions, right. regardless of whether the mouse is healthy or not. Of course, in the autoimmune mice, there's tons more of them, and they make a lot more autoantibodies. When you say autoimmune mice, are these, these are mice that are a natural autoimmune, or they're, they're, they're some strain that's particularly develops autoimmune uh, autoimmune Yeah, this disease. is a strain of mice like the NZBW mice or the MRL strains of mice that are well, or an, and another strain of mice we use a lot, which is called MER, MER knockouts. Mm. They're knocked out for a macrophage mm. receptor that people work on and does a lot of different things, but one of the things it does is consume, uh, allow the macrophage to eat up dead tissue. So there's a lot of dead cells knocking around in these mice, right. I suppose, and they become, they start making autoantibodies. And in all of these strains of mice, you see these cells show up. So then we went to look for them in human beings. Now in mice, they don't, they're mostly in the spleen. They seem to like being in the spleen, and it's not too easy to get the spleens out of human beings. Mm. They're reluctant to part with them. Uh, but in peripheral blood, we see these cells in the peripheral blood of elderly women who have autoimmune disease. 
not young women with the same disease in the peripheral oh, really? blood. So, so, so there can be young women who have autoimmune disease and they don't have these APCs? They not in their blood, but not we started to, we have had the chance to get some spleens from women who are having their spleens taken out for other reasons, mm -hmm. not because they're autoimmune. No. And again, we see these cells in the spleens of these young women, actually younger women, and not in young men or elderly men, actually, for that matter. So it seems that there's something about gender that mm. is driving the appearance of these cells. And what? And so what, what's the consequence of having these cells is that, th that they produce these autoimmune, these antibodies that are... Yeah, so in body? mice we can do this experiment, uh, which is to, by various kind of genetic tricks that we all have up our sleeves these days, get rid of them. And when we get... When a mouse is autoimmune and we get rid of these cells, the autoantibodies disappear at the same time. Yeah. So it seems as though they're the precursors for short-lived plasma cells that are actually producing the autoantibodies. Um, that's correlative, of course, because all we know is we got rid of the cells and the autoantibodies went away. So we're deducing that that means they're the cause of the autoantibody production, mm -hmm. but there could be some very indirect effects, I suppose. And, and likewise, in mice that are getting glomerulonephritis, for example, mm -hmm. if you get rid of these cells, the kidney disease caused by the autoantibody complexes in the kidney disappear too. And is that also true of the, the autoimmune, the mice with the autoimmune disease? If yes. you get rid of these cells, their yes. autoimmune disease improves too? Yes. So the, the obvious question is, how are you... How, how are you going to do this in <laughs> human beings? <laughs> so the postdoc who does this work, we have two postdocs who are working on this project. They're married to each other, actually. Uh, but one of them, the, m the male version, Talia Rubsoff, is busy trying to construct um, an antibody combination. It's a um, antibody in which one arm will react with one part of the B cell and the other arm will react with CD11C with the hope that you can uh, focus this antibody on ABCs in human beings mm -hmm. and knock them off and see if that would have any effect on autoimmune disease. Do you know anything about how these cells arise in, in women? Yes, we or do. Females. Uh, uh, certainly, in female mice, we know that they uh, they come. Um, other people who work on these cells. I know you've never heard of them, but there are other groups that work on these cells. Um, the group of Mike Cancro at the University of Pennsylvania showed that these cells arise from your ordinary common garden follicular B cell, which is the majority of the naive B cells in mice and human beings. And that in order to, uh, we have shown that in order to get them off the ground and convert into this kind of B cell, they need to have a signal through their B cell receptor, which in the case of the autoimmune B cells would presumably be an autoantigen. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. They need to get a signal through their TLR, their toll like receptors. Mm -hmm. And the one that works the best is TLR7, the receptor for single stranded RNA. Um, and they need to get a signal from interferon gamma. So you could imagine in a virus infection, for example, that a virus-specific B cell would get all those three signals simultaneously. They'd get a signal through their B cell receptor because they're busy recognizing a retrovirus or whatever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Tons of T cells around making gamma interferon, and there's plenty of TLR7 ligands around from the virus and the damaged cells and whatnot. And we do see these cells show up in large numbers in mice infected with several different viruses. And they are the major, they turn into the major producers of uh, the isotype IgG2A, which is the uh, most important uh, antibody in dealing with many different viral infections. So they are, ag they, they're, they're in the armamentarium of the immune response for a reason. So, and th and the the age related aspect to it. Yes. Is it simply that it takes that sort of length of time in uh, that part of the lifespan for these cells to yeah. develop, or is there some particular something particular mm. that happens in an aged female? Well, the aged mice in our facility are not supposed to be being challenged with viruses, so presumably they're not arising in response to some untoward virus that we don't know about, although you never know, of course. Mm -hmm. 
So actually, there are two parts to your question, I think. One is age and the other is gender. Why do they well only show up in females? Let's do the age bit first. Okay. Although I suppose they could be connected if, if, if it's I hormonal. Would imagine, yeah. Um, we've tried the castration experiment in mice, of mm. course, and it doesn't seem to be a hormonal issue, although who knows? Because mm. we don't castrate them young enough or something. Yeah. Um, I think that in a healthy mouse that's not infected, what happens in the female mice is um, there's obviously, gr over the course of time for all of us, there's gradual appearance of dead cells and debris and whatnot and stuff that would engage TLR7 mm -hmm. and perhaps to some extent stimulate gamma interferon. And then uh, something we didn't discuss, but it comes back to the gender issue. TLR7 is an X chromosome encoded gene. Yeah. And um, what evidence is there that X is the other X is completely mm -hmm. silent? So mm -hmm. there is evidence that the other X is not completely silent, that there are little patches of genes on uh, from a number of different groups, mm -hmm. not us. The X, the w supposedly silent X, is not completely knocked out. Um, and so we suppose, but we don't know, that TLR7 may be slightly better expressed in females than males and actually right now we're trying to do experiments to check whether that's actually true it's not in the pseudo-autosomal region of the x no no i mean it's in an as area far as i know expect yeah. to be to be shut down it's right exactly the um other s sort of rather indirect evidence about this is that the oklahoma group has shown that um the group that used to be in oklahoma um Men who have two X's and a oh Y <laughs> have the same susceptibility to lupus no. as women do. Fascinating. Now, I don't know what happens to the estrogens in these men, but I guess there's mm, they're men, after all. Yeah. So, um, yeah. are you there, there are presumably not enough individuals who are triple X to be able to look for a, a dosage. Uh, I don't know if there is a triple X. Women, yeah. you mean? Uh, yes, they are women. Yes, are of there? course they are. So yeah. I don't know... There are, th I mean, there are, there are more than, there are other X chromosomal imbalances or, or polypolities. Yes, right, and of course there's XO, yes, um, yeah. Turner yeah. syndrome. So, uh, and I don't know about them either. All I know is this: if you're a man and you have two X chromosomes mm. and a Y, you, you have, have a susceptibility yeah. to lupus, which is equivalent to a woman. So that suggests, oh, there's something maybe on the X chromosome itself, right, on the on sure. the s supposedly silenced X. It may not be TLR7. There's another TLR is TLR8 is also on mm -hmm. that chromosome. And other people have looked at TLR7. Sylvie Boland at NIH and um, other groups have overexpressed TLR7 in mice, and you get autoimmunity mm -hmm. out of that. No, I mean and ABCs, incidentally, oh as well. Yeah. I'm sure you're well, absolutely certain your data are compelling. The reviewers don't always think well, that. You know, that's just what gets coming on to it. Just because data are compelling doesn't necessarily mean that a new observation or new idea becomes accepted. And I mean, I was quite taken aback having read your abstract. So, was were the ABCs um, accepted? Uh, was was this finding quickly yeah. become accepted, or was it controversial? Or I, th I think the problem with autoimmune disease and this kind of finding is that autoimmune disease is, you know, the the Buddhist elephant. And yeah. everybody has a bit, and this is uh, just a fingernail. I don't know if elephants mm. have fingernails, but they must have some sort. Well, anyway, of some fingers. small part of the elephant. So autoimmune disease is caused has a lot of different factors that predispose individuals towards autoimmunity. Gender is one of them, mm. and a huge amount of the gender effect is is the hormones, and this is just another part of the elephant. Maybe the eye. That's <laughs> nice, isn't it? <laughs> well, all the tail, the tail's wagging the rest of the elephant. Yeah, I mean, yes. Uh, maybe there are movies about that kind of <laughs> yes, thing. Maybe we, should, maybe we should finish with that. Yeah. Pippa, thank you very much indeed. Okay, thank you.